Hello and welcome to today's show. As a rule, I avoid politics the way a long-haired third grader avoids the cooties, but it's unavoidable. The scope of this video is the separation of powers, the structure of government, the legislative process, and at the end we will discuss an existing U.S. Supreme Court opinion. Oh, 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 oh. And uh, no one person represents an entire group. There is nothing in this video which should be construed to malign the hardworking American civil service employee. So come on back. Initially, I hadn't planned to go this far into this subject, but I can't remember if it was before or after James Comey admitted that uh, he was, in fact, a leaker for the government. Well, who, anybody who releases uh, secret or classified information should be treated uh, accordingly. And um, someone online made a statement to me that uh, have I ever heard of separate but equal I was ignorant and needed to take a civics class well of course I responded in kind with a little more zeal so we've got a little demonstration here we're going to set up and kind of explain that basics because it does fit nicely into the part two which will be the explanation and going into a, a United States Supreme Court opinion where we're going to read from and we don't practice law in this state. We don't practice law in any state. We don't give legal advice. Uh, this is just entertainment. We have God above. That's from whom all rights flow. The next level, the United States Constitution. And when this was created, it was deliberately created to be difficult to change. When our founders brought this stuff up, they developed three branches, the judicial, the legislative, the executive branch. The Supreme Court is at the top of the judicial, the legislative, which makes the laws. And then we have the executive, which is topped by the president. Under the legislative branch, it is divided what you remember into the House and the Senate. And the House initiates spending bills and things where finance is. The Senate, after they pass the House bill, they work on legislation as well. And it has to post both of those. Now, in the executive branch, we have administration and enforcement. And we have the judicial branch expanded. Supreme Court obviously is the very top. We're going to discuss an opinion, a specific opinion from which constructive possession comes from. But as we see how the government flows, it flows from God, right from God, the Constitution. The Constitution was deliberately set up to be difficult to change. Now we have the legislative branch, those who make the laws, House of Representatives, which is of course done by population, evenly distributed around the United States, get representation, and the Senate is two per state. That has to go through both of them, and when they do, they pass laws. The laws are recorded in the United States Code, the USC. Now, the executive branch is in administrative enforcement. They pass laws which are authorized by the Constitution, the President is in charge of enforcing and putting these laws into effect over here. Now they have a cabinet. The cabinet has different departments. Uh, the Department of Justice, State, and Treasury. These were the original three cabinet members. It was later added in order, Interior, Agriculture, Commerce, which used to be Labor, and then they broke Labor back out of Commerce, and those two really should be Together, labor should be uh, eliminated. Defense, health and human services, housing and urban development, that's a relatively new one. Transportation, 
energy, education, and homeland security. And education was essentially only uh, a couple of decades old. I can remember when Ed Department of Education at the federal level did not exist. Well, let's try to put together a real world example of some legislation moving through or perhaps not moving through. It just kind of depends. All right, now we hear a lot about the Hearing Protection Act of 2017, or the, the, the Silencer Act, the Suppressor Act, whatever they might want to call it. You, you, I'm sure if you're a pro-gun individual, you uh, have a, an awareness of this. So you can type that into a search engine, Hearing Protection Act, and you want to look at when it comes up in hits for this website and look up here in the bar and it shows up that it is congress.gov that is your government in action it goes under bill the congress the house or senate bill and then of course the number so it's not real cryptic but it's a lot like a tree you got to go to the website uh, look for bills because there are other things out there as far as past legislations pending that kind of thing uh, so you want to look for the correct thing so we, we bring it up it, it traces easily these days and we get to house bill 367 now as we mentioned earlier as a bill has got to go through the house and the senate and they have to be uniform or they got to be reconciled together in order to become a law and you've got to, of course meet the minimum number of people in the house and people in the senate who each vote for it, this bill in its current form well if you look right here to what we call related bills and we click this tab you get the screen right here and what it does is it tells us okay we have a related bill now this related bill is senate bill 59 and if we click it we bring up this page and we can see that we have senate bill 59 hearing protection act of 2017 this is the companion bill in the senate and the latest action has been in January when it was introduced. It's been referred to Committee in Finance. Now, if the Finance Committee decides that they don't like it or they don't have the votes or they're distracted by other political things on the Hill, it may not move out of that committee. If it doesn't move out of that committee, it would be said to have died in committee. If it was an house, it would be the same thing. It has to go all, and there are multiple committees that these things have to go through. It might have to go through the uh, Committee on Finance because this particular bill has in its text that the fees will be refunded and that runs, uh, believe it or not, to the millions of dollars. Uh, governments are not often in the mood of handing money back to the people that paid it. So that may be a killer. They may end up with an amendment. Say the Senate amends the bill and the house doesn't and they both pass it those bills don't match it's not the same law there's something that has to be done to reconcile the difference at that point then it's up to the president now how does the president um, deal with this well let's go back to uh, the original page that we were looking at these house bill if we, as we sit on the house bill we see a number of things. We see we got 146 co-sponsors. So that's the sponsor and the co-sponsors added together. 146 people. If you pick that tab, you'll run down and you can see who has jumped on board and said, okay, I want my name attached to the bill. That doesn't mean they voted for it, but it's a pretty good indication that they will vote for it if they're going to co-sponsor it. Others may never co-sponsor the bill, but they may still vote for it. So it's still an indicator of the future of the bill. This possibly may be a show bill. It may not have any chance to pass the Senate, in which case members of the House may want to attach their name to a bill that has no reasonable chance to pass simply by putting their name to it, and then they can say, not only did I vote for the bill, I co-sponsored it, and it goes back home to the people, and the people think they have great representation, and they may in fact have great representation because it takes more than the reps it takes the senators the difference is whether or not someone knows the bill has no chance of passing now we don't know that we're not just pre-distracted with all the other nonsense that's going up on the hill right now and it may in fact start rolling through the committees but as we see 
Well, on the actions tab, there's only been five actions and they were associated in January and February of this year. It does not appear to be moving. Doesn't mean it won't. Now, how does a president or the administration impact the process of a bill? Well, as we see, uh, the legislative branch, which is the House and Senate, once they pass a bill, the president has to essentially accept it or reject it. Now, he can have a bill basically pushed on him if you have a veto-proof majority in both the House and the Senate. That's kind of rare. So what normally happens is the administration will get a, no a notice of all bills introduced. They'll go through the various cabinet members and their d departments and divisions and pieces and all the way down. And those people in those departments will say, yeah, I like it. No, I don't like it for this reason. Now, suppressors were added through the Gun Control Act, I think in the 70s or 80s. They're fairly recent uh, addition because a suppressor is not a firearm. It's not a gun. It is a muzzle device. But it was added to that regulation so that they could be restricted as a classified item under the NFA, the National Firearms Act. So what we have here is a device, and it goes in there. We have a regulatory agency. Now, if the people at the NFA, the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, or the Justice Department, because it, the Justice Department is the department for which the ATF is assigned, if they look at it and go, no, no, we don't want to change the rules, we don't like it, we think it's going to be a bad idea, they respond and they kick the reasons and the things that they don't like about it and what they believe. And the president may go against a cabinet member and say, I, I agree, I like it, or no, I don't agree. Uh, so the position of the administration is very important. The administration says, we oppose it. Most of the time when administration opposes a bill, it will die right there because to get that veto-proof majority is very difficult. And why would you spend your political capital pushing a bill that you know has zero chance of passage? And that's often what happens. It's not that they can't, it's just that they often are unable to get those numbers. You've heard of the position whip, minority whip, majority whip, whatever you want to call it. Normally, these people's job is to whip up votes, whip people into shape, get them together, and they work on legislation, and they're special people designed, whose job it is designed to advance legislation and work out the differences, to get people on board, to get the votes they need, to whip up the votes. So that's about it as far as this goes. In the next video, we'll look at a Supreme Court decision where we actually see an action taken against uh, a private entity for what the administration at, at that time felt was a violation of law or rule or CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, or federal law in something that they were doing. So it went up through the various federal courts to the appellate courts and landed on the Supreme Court. And we'll look back and forth and just see where some of this stuff is and maybe it'll help you understand legislation a little bit better. Thank you for watching. And remember, we don't practice law. We're not playing lawyer in any state. We just have a kind of a natural curiosity to how this stuff works.